In the world of Narnia, there's no shortage of fantastic and memorable creatures. Whether it's noble unicorns, rebellious beavers, shifty apes, fierce centaurs, the list goes on and on. But by far, for a large swath of Narnia fans, there's one fantastic creature that stands out above the rest. One that's universally beloved, admired, respected, and in some cases, revered. Of course, I'm talking about the mighty mouse, Sir Reepycheep. Today, we're going to examine the life of Reepycheep the mouse. And while Reepycheep's life only spans across two books in the Narnian series, his story actually runs throughout the history of Narnia, from the first book to the very last. But before we do, I want to give you a quick update about this channel. After taking a long pause over the holidays, I've heard from a lot of you that you'd like episodes to be released more regularly. So instead of posting an episode every month or so, I'm considering posting every two weeks. Now, this is going to take a lot of work and it's a big commitment. So I need to know if it's something you think is worthwhile. I need you to show me. And the best way to do that is by helping me reach 15,000 subscribers. If this channel reaches 15,000 subscribers in the next week, I'll commit to releasing a new video every two weeks for the next six episodes. So if you haven't already subscribed, go ahead and do it now. There's a lot to get into today, so let's get started. It's time to leave the Shadowlands behind and step into a world that's more real than our own. It's time to follow me into the wardrobe. Reepy Cheep the Mouse was born during the Narnian age of the Telmarine Conquest, which spanned from Narnian year 1998 until the year 2303, when Caspian X finally overthrew the usurper Lord Miraz and reclaimed the throne as the King of Narnia. This was a dark time in Narnia's history, as the Telmarines aligned themselves with the wicked nation of Calarman. They abandoned Caraparavel as the nation's capital, and worst of all, they eradicated all talking animals and other non-human creatures from the boundaries of Narnia. Those that survived took refuge in the forests surrounding human settlements and were eventually forgotten, dismissed by the humans as nothing more than old legends and fairy tales. These surviving creatures would begin to refer to themselves as the Old Narnians. So it was in the relative safety of these dense, quiet woods and glens that Reepy Cheep the Mouse was born. Not much is known about Reep's childhood, but it was during this time that as a young child, Reepy Cheep's life would be forever changed by a simple lullaby. It was then that a friendly dryad would rock Reep to sleep, singing this simple song. Where sky and water meet, where the waves grow sweet, doubt not, Reepy Cheep, to find all you seek. There is the utter east. Reepy Cheep never forgot that song. Even though he didn't understand its meaning, it called out to him his entire life. And in time, he would discover that it was more than just a lullaby. It was a prophecy. Now, by the next time Narnian history records Reepy Cheep, we meet him as a young man in the Narnian year 2303. During this time, Prince Caspian had also fled to the Narnian woods. He did this in order to escape his wicked uncle Moraz, who was plotting to murder him. While he was in hiding, the Golden Age kings and queens of Narnia, the Pevensies, had been summoned back from their world to help overthrow Moraz, and Caspian and Peter were traveling the countryside along with the badger Truffle Hunter and the dwarves Nicobrick and Trumpkin. They were off in search of the hidden Narnians of old, in an attempt to raise up an army to defeat Moraz. And it was on this tour that they came to a small burrow in the hillside on the edge of a warm green meadow. Out of this burrow popped a mouse, but not just any mouse, of course. He stood nearly a foot tall on his hind legs and had ears nearly as long as a rabbit's. This, of course, was Reepy Cheep. He carried his signature rapier sword, but many people would be surprised to know that he was not yet wearing his signature red feather on his head. That would come later, presumably to signify an important achievement which we'll discuss later as well. Now, when Reepy Cheep appeared to the party, Caspian was quite surprised. After all, he'd never seen such a huge mouse before, particularly one who could talk. Now, Peter, however, was quite familiar with them. In fact, he held them in high regard as he knew how they came to Narnia in the first place. You see, for the first several thousand years, there weren't actually any talking mice in Narnia, just wild, dumb, regular run-of-the-mill rodents. When Aslan had given himself to Jadis the White Witch to be sacrificed on the stone table, he had been bound with ropes before he was shaved and beaten. The next morning, 
As Aslan's body lay dead and bound on the stone table, a group of common dumb mice came and chewed the ropes free in a simple gesture of compassion and kindness. It was because of this act that the resurrected Aslan turned them into talking mice, the first of Reepicheep's ancestors. And so whether or not he knew it, Reep came from a long line of noble creatures. And so the noble Reepicheep, as the chief of his people and the leader of a small band of 11 other mice, enlisted himself, his second in command, Peepicheek, and the rest of his company into the service of Caspian's army. And while they look small, they prove that looks can be deceiving. Reepicheep and his company of mice proved their worth by fighting in the Second Battle of Baruna, which also took place in the Narnian year 2303. Their primary fighting tactic was to attack the feet of their enemies with a swift blow from their swords. This technique was very effective. A great many Telmarine soldiers fell to their blows, and when they fell, the mice finished them. Those that didn't fall were slowed down enough to be taken out by larger Caspian fighters. And when the final blow was dealt that day, Caspian's army had defeated Miraz and taken back the Narnian throne. But the victory was not without casualties. Reepicheep was mortally wounded and lay dying on the battlefield. A few drops from Lucy's magic healing cordial saved his life that day, but he discovered that his tail had been cut off. And while Aslan insisted that the scar was quite becoming, Reepicheep explained that a mouse's tail was his highest symbol of honor. Though Aslan said that he sometimes wondered whether Reepicheep thought too much of his own honor, Aslan was moved by the love of Reepicheep's people and granted Reep's request, fully restoring his tail before Aslan had even finished speaking. Because of his leadership in battle, Reepicheep was knighted by Caspian into the knighthood of the Order of the Lion. From then on, he was known as Sir Reepicheep, bound to protect and defend Narnia as the nation entered into a new age where Caspian was now king and where Narnia would henceforth belong to the talking beasts and the dwarves and the dryads and fawns and other creatures quite as much as to the men. Reepicheep makes a final grand gesture at the end of Prince Caspian as the Telmarines prepare yet fearfully hesitate to walk through Aslan's interdimensional doorway which would take them out of Narnia and into our world. In order to set an example to the fearful Telmarines, Reepicheep offers to take the lead. And while Aslan tells Reep that it's the others that must lead this time, there's no doubt that the little mouse had once again shown himself to be bigger than anyone in the crowd. In the Narnian year 2306, Reepicheep joined the now King Caspian aboard the decks of the great ship Dawn Treader, which set out on its famous voyage to find the seven lost lords of Narnia. It's during this journey that Reepicheep is reunited with Lucy, Edmund, and along with their cousin Eustace, who have once again unexpectedly been brought into Narnia in a surprising way. Sometime during the years that had passed, Reepicheep must have gone through quite a growth spurt because now he had doubled in size to about two feet tall and he's finally donned his signature gold headband and red feather which is presumably a sign of his newfound status as a royal knight. Now, Reepicheep had obviously attained a high status with the king, and he served as one of Caspian's most wise and trusted advisors. His fearless encouragement and astute observations played a crucial role in the success of the Don Treader's mission to discover the fate of the lost lords. But that was not Reepicheep's greatest motivation on this journey. Caspian revealed that Reepicheep had been driven for many years by an almost inescapable desire to fulfill the prophecy that had been sung over him long ago, to reach the utter east and then to Aslan's country. Reepicheep, along with the rest of the Don Treader crew, discovered many islands which had been unknown to most of the Western world. In fact, he was almost certainly the first talking mouse to set foot on these islands. There was Dragon Island, Burnt Island, Deathwater, Land of the Duffers, Dark Island, although technically he didn't step foot there, and finally, Ramandu's Island, where the crew finally discovered the last two lost lords, who were both trapped under a powerful sleeping enchantment. Now, it was on Ramandu's Island that Reepicheep discovered that there was a greater reason for the prophecy that had been sung over him. For as that ancient star explained, in order for the enchantment on the lost lords to be broken, the crew would indeed have to sail to the end of the world, and one of them would have to continue on even beyond there, never to return again. 
When Reepicheep heard that, he knew that he had been destined from birth to be the one who would break this spell. And in fact, it was his heart's desire. And so, Reepicheep sailed on with a small contingency towards the utter east. They sailed through the realm of the underwater kingdom of the sea people into the still waters of the lily-covered sea until they ran aground at the edge of the world whose boundary was marked by a giant standing wave which served as both a barrier and a bridge to Aslan's country. After saying his goodbyes to Lucy, Edmund, Eustace, and Caspian, Reepicheep drew his sword one final time and saying, I won't be needing this anymore, he cast it into the sea where it landed hilt up. He boarded a small coracle and let the current carry him straight up the wave until he disappeared from sight. And in doing so, the spell was lifted and the lords were awakened. Now, some may say that while Reepichi was never seen in Narnia again, that's not quite true. Because at the very end of Narnia's history, after Aslan had called down the stars, flooded the mountains and commanded Father Time to snuff out the sun, Lucy and the other seven friends of Narnia found themselves standing at the gates of Aslan's garden, which was located in the truer, more real Narnia of Aslan's country. And when those gates opened, they saw the last thing they would have ever expected, a little, sleek, bright-eyed, talking mouse with a red feather stuck in a circlet on his head and its left paw resting on a new sword. It bowed a most beautiful bow and said in a regal voice, Welcome in the lion's mane. Come further up and further in. Well, that's all the time we have for today. But before you go, I'd love to hear your thoughts about Reepicheep. Tell me why you think so many people view him as their favorite character in all of Narnia. And if you've got a character you'd like for me to cover, be sure to leave it in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe. I look forward to seeing you next time as we take another journey into the wardrobe.